In just a moment, suspense with Madeline Carroll. Hello. Oh, hello, Tom. Where are you? Thought you were driving over tonight. Couldn't get your car started. Well, what's wrong with it? Uh-huh. Well, sounds like ignition trouble to me, Tom. Why don't you call Ed's Auto Electric, best service station in town? He's an Autolite man. Really knows his stuff and believes in preventive service. You know, fixes things before they happen. Carries Autolite parts. You, you know, Autolite. Spark plugs, batteries, complete ignition systems. Yeah, that's right, the works. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, Tom, Autolite has that swell high-tension show on the air, Suspense. Ever hear of it? Well, why don't you tune in? It's coming on right now. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Madeline Carroll in Anton Leder's production of The Morrison Affair, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Oh, Mr. Ballou, there's a woman outside. She doesn't have an appointment, but uh, she must speak to Mr. Ballou privately. All right, I'll see her. I'll lay you six to five. It's a divorce. She's got that nothing must get in the paper, Lord. <clears throat> Will you come in, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ballou. Please sit down. Uh, Dottie, buzz me when it's half past. Okay, Mr. Ballou. We can't be overheard here, can we? No. Now then, Mrs. I'd rather you didn't take notes. Oh, well, all right. But I do need your name. I'll tell you later. Uh, do lawyers have any kind of code or rule against revealing confidential information? <laughs> like priests? Yes. However, you want me to promise before I hear your case? Yes. All right, if it makes you feel better. I've handled hundreds of divorces. Oh. And never lost a patient. It uh, is a divorce. Yes, in a way. But he's dangerous, and there's a child. The courts usually lean toward giving the mother custody. I know, but, but Mr. Ballou, I'm in desperate trouble, I'm afraid. You can't understand till I tell you. Well, then? You see, I'm English. My husband is American. He grew up here in Boston, a very prominent family. The, the Morrisons. He's Dr. Paul Morrison. Yes, I know Dr. Morrison. Oh? Uh, that is, I've heard of him. Then you know he's a surgeon. I met Paul in London in 1939. We were married very soon after we met. And then England went to war, and Paul decided to stay in England to help out. He was different then. So deeply concerned over human suffering. The war changed him. Changed him hideously. But those first two years in London, we were happy. Almost completely happy. Quite suddenly, America was in the war... And Paul had his orders to return to the American Army Medical Corps. We spent the little time we had left at a cottage in the country. And all the time I was trying to forget the one thing that had been preying on my mind ever since they told me at the hospital that... that... But I couldn't. And so finally, even though it was our last day together, I went up to London to do what I had always known someday I would have to do. It was late afternoon when I returned. Who is it? Oh, darling, where on earth have you been? I'm sorry I'm so late, Paul. Well, never mind about being sorry. Come over here this instant. Give me a kiss. <sighs> Want to know something? What? You're a heartless hussy going off and leaving me alone all day. Our last day. Do you think I'd have gone if it hadn't been important? Now look, darling, I'm a doctor too. I don't know what doctor you went to see this time, but... None of us can perform miracles. I don't believe in miracles, Paul, and I, and I didn't go to London to see a doctor. I went to find out if we could adopt a child. Adopt a child? I know you've always been against the idea, Paul. Darling, this is no time but... to go into a big, complicated thing like that. I've got to be on my way home by this time tomorrow. It's not this time tomorrow I'm thinking about, Paul. It's all my life. If I can't have a child of my own, then I want to adopt one. But, Sheila, I... I sort of halfway picked out one at the orphanage today. What? His parents were killed in an air raid, and, and, oh, Paul, you've always wanted a boy. I've wanted a son, yes. But adopting a child involves certain risks. It, there are fundamental laws of heredity. Now that... you're being plain old-fashioned. You can call it anything you like. It's out of the question. Why? Give me one reason why. You know the reasons as well as I do. All I know is I'm a woman and I want a child. 
Sheila, come here. Look at me. Maybe I'm old-fashioned or overcautious, but if we got a child that way, picked him out like something on a grocery shelf, you might feel he was your son, but he wouldn't be mine. And the son has to be for both of us. Or not at all. I stayed on in London for more than six months after Paul left. It was ghastly there for everyone. As for me, I lived in a fever of loneliness, worse than loneliness. Then my mother asked me down to the country to wait out the war with her. It was a summer evening when I took a crowded train from Paddington, and I sat alone in the compartment, numb with my hunger for Paul. You must understand, that day I wasn't myself. I wasn't accountable. You see, I had a double kind of loneliness. When the conductor opened my compartment door for other passengers, I didn't even look up at first. You are, Mrs. I'll shoot you. Oh, thank you ever so much. It's the window seat. No, well, I want the window I seat. Now oh, then, now oh, then, you two. I reckon the missus is going to want some of that fresh air for the little nipper. Here, you can have my seat if you like. It doesn't make any difference to me. Oh, it's very kind of you, miss, I'm sure. Mum, I want to see the guards then. Not now, Johnny. But, Mum, you promised. Missus, I'll let you know when we're near Reading Junction. Uh, oh, thank you. Don't trouble at all, missus. Uh, I hope Mary's not taking up too much room on the seat, miss. No, no, not at all. Well, she's shoving and pushing me, Mum. Now, Mary. I'm not I'm either. I just need back. more room than him. I'm not just bigger. stop it. Mary, stop rummaging in my carry-all. There's nothing in it to eat. Oh, dear. Children can be such a trial. Oh, hush now, now, hush. Yes, I know you're hungry. Can I hold him for a minute? Hey, what, what, miss? Mary is a pig. You two like to look at pictures. Here's a magazine with all sorts of pictures about America. Oh, My husband sent it to oh, me. Oh, that's kind of you, miss, I'm sure. Now, thank the lady. Thank her. Thank Come you, on. husband. Yeah, that'll keep them quiet. A mother ought to be two people, that she ought. I'll hold the baby while you fill his bottle. What? Well, if it won't trouble you. Oh, no, no. I don't mind. Yeah. I sat there, scarcely breathing looking down at the baby in my lap. It was as though I'd never felt warmth before. He stopped whimpering and looked up at me with very big brown eyes that seemed to hold recognition. He's taken a real fancy to you, miss, and no mistake. What's his name? Jamie. It was his father's name. He was killed last week in a bomber over Germany. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. But at least you have the children. Oh, yes, miss. But sometimes, I don't know... Sometimes I think it would be better if, if I didn't have this last one. Oh, no, you can't mean that. It's not easy, miss, with no man to provide. You said you're married, miss. Do you have any children? No, I have no children. Uh, yeah, baby. You'd know if you had one. Knowing all the things I won't be able to give him. I can't help thinking he'd be better off if I left him on someone's doorstep, so to speak. Someone... Well fixed, like you. You'd regret it all your life. But it's his life I'm thinking about when I say it. Of course, I'm not brave enough to do it. But I wish I was. Oh, well. If wishes was horses, as they say. We're just pulling into Redding Junction, missus, if you still want to get that cup of tea. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Mary. Come on, Mary. Mum's going to get us yeah. something to eat. I want to see this pies first. Well, you can look at the magazine when you come back. Now, now, run along, bus. I'll be on wait for me outside. All right, Mum. Come mm. on, lady. Well, wait till I get my coat I'll on, take Mom. Jamie now, miss. I'm going to sit right here. Why don't I hold him till you come back? Oh, uh, I wouldn't want to bother you. Oh, it's no bother at all. Well... You won't have any trouble with him. He's always been a good baby. Mom, you come on, come on, come on, I'll wait. If you're sure, miss. Quite sure. Oh, yes, I'm quite sure. Maybe you'll say what I did was wicked, that she didn't tell me to take her child. But I know she did. She made her decision and I made mine. After a few minutes, I got up and carried the baby down the corridor. I was trembling, so I was afraid I'd drop him. I managed to get off the train and made my way across the crowded platform. It was nearly time for the train to pull out. Hurry up, now. Train's leaving. Then I saw the woman, her, her two older children coming toward me. I stepped behind a post. Oh, she's a pig. Mary's a wicked pig. Too far. Oh, she's a pig. 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 Oh, she's a pig
I stood there and watched the three climb onto the train. Then he began to move. And it was the brakes or a train whistle. If only I hadn't imagined it was something else. Above the racket of the train, it sounded like... Like a woman screaming. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Madeline Carroll in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hello. Oh, it's you again, Tom. Swell program, eh? What? The name of that Autolite service station? Well, it's... Ed's Auto Electric. Uh, just look for the big Autolite sign down on Main Street. Uh, but wait, here's more dope on Autolite service. Listen to Frank Martin. For expert ignition checkup and repair, stop at your nearest Autolite service station. Highly trained mechanics working with specialized machines are ready to give your car the best, most complete, most reliable ignition service possible. And when it comes to replacement parts, why money can't buy finer ignition equipment than Autolite. Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of electrical equipment for automobiles. And many of America's finest cars and trucks are equipped with Autolite distributors, coils, generators, starting motors, batteries, and spark plugs right on the assembly line. So, friends, if you want truly reliable ignition, parts, and service, call on your nearest Autolite service station or the car dealer who sells your make of car. service stations are listed in your classified telephone directory under automotive electrical service. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Madeline Carroll as Sheila in The Morrison Affair, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I can't file for your divorce, Mrs. Morrison, until but... you and your husband turn the child over to the British consul. My husband doesn't know. He thinks it's his child. He suspects something's wrong, but... Well, then make a clean breast of it. Tell him. Oh, no, you mustn't. He mustn't ever know. He'll kill me or Jamie or both of us. How on earth did you make your husband believe? That was easy. I figured it all out on the way to Mother's. I took a bus at Reading Junction, then another train... It was almost midnight when I got home and let myself in the front door. Mother was waiting up. Is that you, Sheila? Yes, Mother. Oh, you've had me well at home. <laughs> Sheila. Is the fire still lit in the kitchen, Mum? Yes, but don't ask questions now, please. He's hungry. I'm going to heat him up some milk. Whose baby is it? He's mine now. What do you mean, Sheila? Was it? I don't know. Here, hold him while I get the milk. Oh, shh, baby, shh. You mean you've adopted him? I stole him. Sheila. I don't ask you to understand, Mother. I only ask you to help me. Because I'm your child and because I can't ever have a child of my own. But Paul won't let you keep this child. If he thinks it's his own, he will. Oh, look, the poor little mite starving. Yes. It may be years before the war's over and I see Paul again. He'll look forward to seeing his son. But he's bound to ask where his son was born. He was born here. But there are records of such things, Sheila. The date, the place, the parents, the doctor. I know. Mother, telephone Dr. Lucas. Dr. Lucas? Why, he, he's a charlatan. He's not even a real doctor. Oh, does that matter? He's greedy, and that's the kind of man I need. Tell him I want to see him tomorrow. Because tomorrow, my son Jamie will be born. That night before I went to bed, I cabled Paul at his last APO address. Why haven't you answered my letters? Or don't you like my news? His answering cable came in the morning. What letters? What news? We'll phone. It was going to be easy. Paul had traveled so much. New York, Baltimore, three months in the Pacific. It would be easy to make him believe that some of his mail had gone astray. I waited all day for Paul's call and for Dr. Lucas. That miserable little man took his time about it. Ah, uh, Mrs. Morrison. 
I'm late, but your mother assured me no one was ill. No, it's about my son. Why, I didn't hear that you I'm had having a... difficulties about his birth record. I've uh, lost the certificate and I need a duplicate. Why, Mrs. Morrison, I'm sure if you write As to... a matter of fact, I want the record changed. Changed? I want the certificate to say that he was born here today. Mrs. Morrison. It can be done, can't it? It's uh, rather difficult. You mean it's expensive? Yes, very expensive. There's the risk to a doctor's reputation. How much? Uh, <clears throat> a thousand pounds. All right. No, I'm afraid it will have to be twelve hundred pounds. All right, but that's all I can pay. Here, you, you can write it out under this lamp. One moment, I'll find the form. Yes, here it is. He's the son of Mr. and Mrs. Paul Morrison. Excuse me, please. Yes? Go ahead, Major Morrison. Hello? Hello, Sheila. Paul! Paul, darling! Where are you? India. I turned the whole army inside out to get a priority. Can, uh, can you hear me all right? Fine. But, darling, why didn't you answer my letters? Well, I answered every one I got. Then the, the important ones got lost or something. You haven't heard the news? What news? You're, you're going to be a father, Paul. Did you hear me, Paul? Yes. But, Sheila, that seems impossible. But it's happened all the same. Any day now, you'll have a son and heir. Oh, you've made up your mind. It's going to be a boy, eh? Huh? That's what you want, isn't it? Yes, it's what I want. But it seems like a miracle. I was dead certain that I... Something wrong, Mrs. Morrison? I was cut off. Operator! Operator! Yes? Operator, I was cut off. It was a call from India. Didn't you hang up? Certainly not. I was cut off. Well, I'll try to get your party back. Yes, try. But it's all right if you don't. Uh, what is the name of your son, Mrs. Morrison? Uh, Jamie. Jamie Morrison. Jamie Morrison, born July 3rd, 1942. You know, Mrs. Morrison... Heredity is tricky. There's nothing wrong with my son's heredity. And then there's always the danger of being found out, as long as anyone knows beside yourself. At first, some nights I dreamed that Jamie's mother had come to fetch Jamie, but that was only at first. I buried my guilt, buried it deep. Four years went by. Then the war was over, and Jamie and I sailed to join Paul in America. The day I arrived in New York, I may have been nervous, but I was sure at last of happiness, as sure as I'd ever been in my life. Oh, Paul. Paul, darling. My dear. Oh, I've never seen you look better, darling. Motherhood suits you. Is that my daddy? Yes, Jamie. Well, well, how do you do, James? My name isn't James. It's Jamie. Jamie? Yes, I, I've always called him that. I don't know why it's a kind of nickname, I suppose. Well, from now on, we'd better settle for James. We Morrisons never appreciated nicknames. Funny about his eyes. His eyes? I've got to look up my Mendel. Can two blue-eyed people have a brown-eyed child? They must. We did, no matter what Mendel says. Well, he's positively the first Morrison with brown eyes. But why not? He's the miracle kid. Miracle kid. Blue eyes. Brown eyes. I rolled the phrases around my mind, hunting their real meaning. I was oversensitive, of course, but but from the first day I felt that Paul was hostile to Jamie. Where's my miracle kid? He's taking his nap. What do you want with him? I'm driving down to the rifle range with a friend. I thought I'd take James along. Oh, but he's too young, Paul. Hmm? Too young for what? To play with guns. Oh, that's just why I want to take him along. The sooner he knows how to handle guns, the better off he'll be. Mommy, Mommy, where are you, Mommy? Here I am, Jamie. Uh, Mommy, I fell off. Oh, darling, darling, what's happened? I fell off the horse. He went too fast and jumped around, and I fell off and hurt my knee. Yeah, I brought the iodine. He's more scared than hurt. Oh, not iodine. Use peroxide. It won't sting. I told you he was too young to ride. Oh, it was a gentle horse. Jamie lost the seat when it started to trot, that's all. We'll do better next time, won't we, kid? I guess so, Daddy. There won't be a next time. 
Yes, there will be, Sheila. Jamie, go up to Mother's room. I'll be along in a minute to fix your knee. All right, Mummy. There's candy in my bureau. You know where. Yes, Mummy. I do. Paul, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to make my son like my son. He's my son, too, you know. What you're doing to him, Sheila, he's not anybody's son. He's a zombie. I swear I'd rather see him dead than what you want him to be. I suppose it was then that I first realized what I would have to do. That someday, someday soon, I'd have to get Jamie away from Paul. I was frightened. I even began to carry a gun in my bag, and I began to make plans. I'd start again, build a new life for myself and my son. Then yesterday, I knew that I'd have to hurry, that I couldn't postpone my decision any longer. I found out when Paul came home from the hospital. He came directly to my room. Ah, there you are. I want to tell you something, Sheila. What is it? What's happened? A oh, big day at the conference. Oh, you mean the medical conference? Yeah, a psychiatrist from Chicago named Drake read a paper on psychosomatic medicine. Terrific. And then there was a curious report on euthanasia. You know, mercy killing. Interesting, but extreme. In what way? Well, the doctor delivering the report favors not only the mercy killing of incurables, he advocates weeding out and purifying the race by studying heredity and eliminating those whose heredity is questionable. <laughs> Real crackpot. Horrible. Sheila, while his report was going on, though, I began to wonder about you and Jamie. About me and Jamie? Yes. I wanted to ask you, is there something about Jamie's heredity that you don't want me to know? Then I understood. The danger was real and now. For myself, but mostly for Jamie. Paul was playing with me like a cat plays with a mouse. This talk about mercy killing, heredity, this subtle, cruel talk, threatening me with Jamie's death, announcing in advance the mercy killing of a child who is inferior because he isn't a Morris. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Ballou. I can't risk Paul's getting custody. I have to take Jamie away first, far away where Paul can't reach him, and then get a divorce. Mm-hmm. I want you to tell me where it's safest for us to go and get the papers I need. <clears throat> Mrs. Morrison, I promised that whatever you told me would be confidential. I'm sorry I made that promise. If I hadn't, I'd go to Dr. Morrison and tell he him... Wouldn't. ...that his wife carries a heavy load of guilt. A very heavy load. And it's coloring everything she does. You think I'm insane? I think you have dangerous delusions. And you won't help me? I can't, Mrs. Morrison. A psychiatrist might help you, but only if you go to him now before it's too late. the hospital. Dr. Morrison said for you to come right away. What is it, Elsa? What's happened? It's the little boy. Jamie! He got hold of one of his daddy's guns. He's done it. He's killed Jamie. Jamie was playing with it and it went off when it was pointed right at himself. He's hurt bad. Take my blood, Paul. Take it. I'll do anything. Sheila, get hold of yourself. You're hysterical. We have to know his blood type first. Now, the lab should be calling back any minute. Paul, I... I'd rather you didn't operate. Ask Dr. McDonald. Well, this isn't McDonald's kind of a case. I... Don't you trust me, Sheila? I thought you might be too nervous being his father. Am I, Sheila? What? Am I his father, Sheila? Dr. Morrison speaking. All right. It's the lab. Hello? Yes, Brooks. It's what? You're absolutely sure. You che You checked twice? I see. Yes, thank you. And gave the results of the blood test. Paul. We can't use your blood, Sheila. You know from the blood test? Yes, Dr. Morrison. Get the boy ready for operation. I'll start immediately. Yes, Doc. No what, Sheila? No, don't tell me. All I know is that your blood is type A and mine is type A and James is type B. Wait here, Sheila. Don't do it, Paul. Do what? I won't let you operate. I won't. I won't. Get Dr. McDonald. Or I'll kill you. You're out of your mind. You can't shoot that gun. I can and I will before I let you touch Jamie. Now that you know he's not your son... I've always known it. You're lying. From the first moment I saw him. It's a proven medical fact. Two blue-eyed people cannot have a brown-eyed child. And all your cruelty was deliberate. At first I thought you'd been unfaithful. 
that Jamie was your son and another man was his father. But the blood proves he's not yours either. You adopted him. I stole him, and I'm not going to lose him now. We're all ready, Dr. Morrison. Thank you. Wait here, Sheila. Paul, I warned you. Mrs. Morrison, don't! <laughs> fell like a sack of dry leaves, and liquid the color of dark grapes seeped through and spread slowly across the front of his surgeon's jacket. Then people came and dragged me away. I've seen no one since except those who guard me, and my lawyer, Mr. Ballou, who came to tell me that Paul was dead and that Jamie would live. The operation was performed successfully by Dr. MacDonald. Then Mr. Ballou began to talk about how to defend me against the charge of murder. Why not tell them the truth? Let me tell you the truth, Mrs. Morrison. After you shot Dr. Morrison, he could have lived. He had to choose between his life and Jamie's. What could he do for Jamie? The bullet had lodged in Jamie's brain. It would take hours to find a brain specialist as good as Dr. Morrison. But he didn't operate. He ordered them to take him to the operating room. Then for an hour and a half, he stood at Dr. MacDonald's elbow, directing every move of his scalpel. When the operation was over, Dr. Morrison was dying. But Jamie would live. And so, in my defense, Mr. Ballou intends to plead insanity. But I wasn't insane then. Nor am I now, I know that. I'm merely a selfish woman. Everything I did, I did for myself, not for Jamie. I can see that now. But Paul gave his life for his son. And no matter what happens to him now, Jamie had a father. Thank you, Madeline Kerr, for a splendid performance. Miss Kerr will return in just a moment. Hello, Tom. Yeah, I knew it was you. What? You just called to say thanks for telling you about Autolite? Well, don't thank me. Frank Martin's your man. Well, friends, you'll thank and congratulate yourself for depending on your Autolite service man because of the way your car will perform after it's had his expert care. He's got the skill, equipment, and those great Autolite parts to put your ignition system in top shape. Look up your nearest Autolite service station. It's listed in your classified phone book under Automotive Electrical Service. And keep in mind, wherever you go, Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Miss Madeline Carroll. It's been a great pleasure to appear with this fine cast on Suspense. It's a program I've always enjoyed hearing, and I'm looking forward to next week's story, in which that rising young star, Burt Lancaster, appears. It's another gripping study in... Suspense. Madeline Carroll appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox whose current production is The Luck of the Irish, starring Ann Baxter and Tyrone Power. Tonight's suspense play was written by Pamela Wilcox, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Gregory Peck, Edward G. Robinson, John Garfield, and others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Burt Lancaster. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive slowly. Death and danger travel in fast company. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.